So in my last reaction to Fat Electrician, I did uh, the Devil Duck. And in there, he had mentioned something about uh, Sergeant Reckless, which is American's uh, War Horse Marine. I said that I was going to watch it off camera because I felt like I was missing some context there. And I was met with an overwhelming response in my comments that I should make a reaction video to it. So it's a long video. So let's go ahead, shut up and get ready to learn. If it were not for the actions of a single beer drinking horse over the course of 48 hours, South Korea as we know it today would probably not exist. That's a crazy statement. Today we're talking about the greatest war horse of all time, the highest ranking animal in Marine Corps history, and the hero of Outpost Vegas, ladies and gentlemen, Sergeant Reckless. Wait, 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 highest ranking. Oh, I see. Not the devil duck. must be one hell of a horse. All right, before we get too far in this video, we do have a sponsor for a couple of reasons. One, I got bills, just gonna be honest with you. Two, I gotta pay the editor. And three, in the case of this particular video, back in the day, it used to be a rule that whenever Sergeant Reckless did any type of publicity, whoever did it had to make a $1,000 donation to a Marine Corps charity. And I am gonna honor that since I'm making this video about her. That being said, this video is brought to you by Raid VPN. Wait, no. Wait, no, well, Oh, well, now I feel kind of, I do not have that type of money to donate. <laughs> um, I don't, hmm, that's interesting. I will take this video down if that is a thing, 100% after I post it, if, if there's enough uproar that's met. Oh, I, I'm kind of, hmm. Nord Shadow Legends, hmm. no. NordVPN, that's the one. Full disclosure, I tried to make a funny skit ad for this video where like me and my wife were both in bed and instead of using a condom, I used NordVPN and then I accidentally put a condom on my phone, but my skit failed miserably. Get out of here, Mushu. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. If I used NordVPN, my dog wouldn't have been able to find me because I'd be in Singapore, actually. NordVPN, your dog can find you, but your internet service provider can. Okay, so believe it or not, I actually do use NordVPN in real life, but I use it for a different reason than any other talking point you've ever heard in a Nord ad ever. Hey, big points to the to, uh, big points to the wifey, right? Willing to do stuff like this. My wife would not be called dead on camera. I have asked her many times throughout the five years of me doing reactions and just no. So I'm just gonna go ahead and show you guys that today. Not All right, so let's say chance. I wanna start working on a new video. So I hop over to Google to find some sources. We pull up Google and let's see what we come up with. Let's say I wanna do a video on Imo Koivunen, the Finnish guy that took a bunch of Pervidin. Google that, here's what pops up. I've, I've got a video. Wikipedia page and then a think, bunch of websites yeah. to just regurgitate the same article over and over and over again. Now, I know that Imo is from Finland. So if I hop over to NordVPN and I actually change my location from America to Finland, Hopefully, since it's his native language, it'll give me some better sources. Two seconds later, I'm now connected to Finland. And as far as anybody on the internet is concerned, I am a Finnish guy in Finland browsing the web. I use Nord now, as well. we just go back and I hit refresh. And as you can see, I have a bunch of different sources all about Imo Koivunen. So we're just gonna pick one. Then I go up here, I hit translate. And now I have a new source of information for my video on Imo that I never would have been able to find were it not for NordVPN. And oh, it has a bunch of other use cases on use top like of that. that. So if you wanted to check it out for yourself you can go to nordvpn.com backslash the fat electrician now let's get back to this video our story takes place during the korean war which is kind of an issue because most people know absolutely nothing about the korean war and it's kind of important for context so we're gonna do a real quick and dirty kind of. simplification of the entire thing super casual 60 seconds we're gonna learn more about the korean war than most people do in their entire k-12 through education go ahead and start the timer here we go july 25th go. 1950 communist north korea backed by communist china and the soviet union decides that they are going to attack south korea and try to take over the entire peninsula over the course of the next five to six weeks they would almost accomplish their goal beating the south korean military all the way to the base of the peninsula and it is not looking good but luckily nato shows up at the last minute to save the day the nato forces are like 90 percent american but there's also some british some canadian some australian and like 12 <laughs> other countries on top of that and they have a huge amphibious landing in incheon and they proceed to turn the tables on the north koreans entirely beating them all the way back into north korea and then they continue to advance beating them all the way up the peninsula and almost to the border of china so now the chinese government's kind of shit in their pants because NATO's like 30 miles off their border and they can't have NATO coming up in their territory with their 
their democracy and their human rights and their food. And their They've boats. got to do something about this. So China Not comes out of left field but... with their big ass military, joins the fight, takes NATO completely by surprise, beats them all the way back down the peninsula to pretty much the original North and South Korean border. And this is where our story begins. I'm not trying to brag, but that was under 60 seconds and I got a Lord of the Rings reference in there. I'm having a really good day. Okay, now that we're on the same page, October 1952, here's what the front line looks narrating. like. Each one of those triangles represents a hill and on top of those hills is a bunch of NATO troops. Basically at this point in time, NATO is now just trying to hold this line long enough to force the communists to sign a peace treaty and preserve South Korea because as it turns out this long string of hills is almost the exact same border that South Korea was before so if they can utilize these hills to hold the high ground maybe they can get this accomplished why do they want to hold the high ground well because the high ground's awesome isn't it Anakin oh. I'm glad he made it yeah I anyways sure if I can bring to. your attention to the furthest triangle on the left where it says the Nevada cities that is not actually one hill but three smaller hills in a close triangular formation commonly referred to as the iron triangle each one of these hills is named after one of the three nevada gambling cities reno carson and vegas the reason that nato named them after the nevada gambling cities is because it is a gamble as to whether or not the marine corps is going to be able to hold that position because if chinese communist forces are going to try to break through this line it's probably going to be right there at the nevada cities because then they will have a direct path to the capital of seoul and if they're able to capture mm. seoul it'll be absolutely devastating to nato's ability to negotiate a peace treaty oh so that's very interesting right and then you know depending on the amount of forces they had you can't you don't want to spread yourself too thin and you also don't want to pack too many soldiers in one place because they now open up another hill i see aptly named so the United States Marine Corps absolutely has to hold this position, and most importantly, they have to hold Outpost Vegas because it is the highest of the three hills, and if they lose Vegas, they are almost guaranteed to lose the other two. Alright, so here's the plan. Each one of these hills is going to have 40 Marines and two Navy Corpsmen on top. These hills are so steep that the only way to get up there is by foot. They're like a 45 degree angle all the way up. So the Marines aren't able to get trucks up there. They're not able to get tanks up there. The only thing they can get up there is barbed wire, shovels for digging trenches, guns, and 75 millimeter recoilless rifles. These recoilless rifles are pretty much going to be the Marines' only chance of defending themselves if they do get attacked. The problem with it is though, since you can't get a truck up on this hill, now the Marines have to carry all the ammunition up themselves, and each shell weighs approximately 24 pounds. So because carrying these shells up this enormous hill one or two at a time absolutely sucks, the Marines get permission to buy a horse or a mule or a donkey or something. So they go down to Seoul and they start looking. And obviously the first place they choose to investigate is the horse race track at Seoul. Is there probably gonna be a pack animal at a race track for sale? No, probably not, because that's racehorses, and racehorses don't make good pack animals. But that is the one place that's gonna have alcohol and gambling. So you Oh, that's interesting. Racehorses don't make good pack animals, because I guess what you're looking for is kind of like strength and yeah. I mean, more than strength. I mean, horses are pretty strong, but I guess horse races are more bred for lean and speed as opposed to, you know, pack animals. But hmm. So you best believe that's where the Marines are going to check first. But as fate would have it, they would meet up with a horse trainer and jockey by the name of Kim Hook Moon, who would be willing to reluctantly sell his horse, Ah Chim Hai, which translates to flame in the morning. He absolutely did not want to sell that's his awesome. horse. He described it as the most beautiful and intelligent horse on the planet, but he did it for $250 because he had to buy his sister a prosthetic leg. I believe her name was Peggy, or was it Eileen? Anyways, the Marines buy this horse, they throw her in a trailer, they take her back to camp. From there, she immediately goes into what the Marines call okay. hoof camp. Get it? Hoof camp, boot camp. That's funny. Moving on. The first thing they do is try to get the horse acclimated to battle by firing the recoilless rifle near her. And the first time they fired this rifle, this horse jumped four feet straight into the air and freaked the fuck out. Then they calmed her down, they fired it again, still scared out of her mind. And they fired it again and again. And by the eighth time they fired it, she was completely calm and a recoilless rifle never scared her ever again. From there, they taught her how to survive. She learned how to avoid barbed wire. She learned not to get too close to the back end of the recoilless rifles because the blowback could hurt her. She learned that whenever a Marine yelled incoming, she needed to run to a nearby bunker. Or if she wasn't near a bunker, she learned how to lay down. After you know, of course, horses can be trained like this. You know what I mean? I, I don't have too much knowledge in, in the way of equestrian and everything. But yeah, they've been training horses for decades for way longer than that olden days you know what i mean so it's just that that's amazing right i know horses just like dogs come in various levels of intellect but just just how far can you train a horse i mean i, I guess i'm hearing it right now that's amazing 
After she completed her training, the Marines ordered her a special saddle to be made and shipped all the way from America that would allow her to carry a bunch of recoilless rifle rounds. Until then, though, she began helping the Marines any way she could, mainly by helping string communications cable between the different outposts and the ammunition point, and she could string more cable than 10 men combined. At this point, the Marines really, really started to string like this cable. horse, so they decided they were going to give her a new name. Reckless, named after the recoilless rifles, which were commonly referred to as reckless rifles. And from that point on, she just became another one of the guys, and that's exactly how the Marines started treating her. She began eating whatever the Marines were eating. She loved bacon and eggs, she loved beer, and apparently, if you were ever having mixed drinks, Reckless would walk up to you, nudge you with her head, and stick out her lower lip, and let you mix a mixed drink directly into her mouth. Then, her special saddle shows up, and she starts kicking ass on the battlefield. She awesome. delivers six rounds at a time, and she can make a trip from the ammo point to the firing position twice as fast as any man can, and he's only carrying two rounds. She delivers so much ammo that over the course of a couple battles, the Chinese actually start to target Reckless. And this ends up being no. a horrific mistake, because the millisecond that Marine Corps leadership figures out that they're trying to target Reckless, they flip the script, turn around to the Marines, and they're like, boys, they're trying to kill Reckless so they oh, can no. eat her because they're starving communists. At which point, all the Marines responded with... Okay, the Marines are. What would they? What would have been funny if they showed that Chuck Norris bit where he was firing and he was like doing those little spins and everything? Dude, that's like one of the most hilarious means. But yeah, I mean, if there's anything that's going to light a fire underneath somebody, is targeting their loved animals. Absolutely furious. This is worse than fucking with Doc. We've got multiple Docs. We've only got one Reckless. We can't allow this to happen. And the Marines begin fighting that much harder. And they have more ammo to fight even harder with because Reckless is right there with them bearing ammo the entire time. From this point on, they begin dominating every skirmish that they take part in. At one point, they're working adjacent to the Australian military and the Australians are so blown away by Reckless that they come up to meet her after the skirmish and they actually give her one of their their campaign hats as a reward for being such a badass on the battlefield. Reckless and the Marines fight and hold the line for the next five months, and by March of 1953, five peace months. talks between North and South Korea are well underway, and it's beginning to finally look like this war might come to a peaceful resolution. But on March 26th, Chinese forces would launch a major offensive, trying to break through the line at the Nevada cities with 4,000 men. For the Ooh. next four days, the Marine Corps and the Chinese fight over these hills. The Chinese take the hill, the Marines take it back, the Chinese take the hill, the the Marines take it back. Eventually, it got to the point where nobody could hold the top of the hill, and you just had the Chinese on one slope of the hill and the Marines on the other. They said that there was so much artillery flying in both directions for the entirety of four days that the sound of individual wow. explosions gave way to what seemed like a constant and consistent roar. For four days, they were completely unable to verbally communicate, and they could only talk to each other via hand signals. And because of all this noise, the Marine Corps forward observers weren't able to effectively communicate with the Marine Corps artillery and mortars, meaning that the artillery and mortars were just firing blindly into the general vicinity of where the enemy should be. Meaning that the only effective fire the Marine Corps has in this fight is coming from the recoilless rifles because they don't require a forward observer and they don't require communication. The wow. And then you also got to take into effect, I mean, the communicating with the hand side, but you also got to take into effect that you just, you're blown eardrums, right? You ain't hearing the same. Oh, and I think that also will give way to uh, PTSD. So many explosions happening that, you know, you find it hard to stay quiet. Uh, or you find sitting in silence very, very frightening, right? Because you're so used to explosions. Four days? I forget how long these battles can go over. I've listened to a lot of Sabaton songs, so I'm familiar with uh, the lengths uh, some of these skirmishes and battles can go through. It's just I often forget, though. The men with the recoilless rifles are the ones spotting the enemy and firing the gun. The recoilless rifles are now the key to winning this battle, and they absolutely have to stay up and running, and they have to get this ammunition up to these hills to fight back. The problem is the ammo point is 750 yards away from the firing position, up a 45 degree angle hill that is constantly being pounded with enemy artillery fire while it's also covered with smoke and white phosphorus. But that doesn't change the fact that the ammunition has to get there, so they load eight rounds into Reckless's pack and they send her up the hill. And the men at the ammunition depot know that it's probably the last time they're ever going to see her again because they've just sent her off to her death. But despite that, she somehow makes it to the firing position. The Marines there unload the ammo and stick a wounded Marine on her back as they send her back down the hill 
also feeling as though they're sending her to her death and it's the last time they're ever going to see their favorite horse. But they're wrong over and over and over again. They're wrong because every 20 minutes like clockwork, Reckless is back at the firing position, bringing more ammunition. And then she's back at the ammunition depot, dropping off wounded Marines. That's amazing. And she does this all day long. And with every trip she makes, she becomes less and less of a horse and more and more the only sign of hope that these men have. Because wow. of this little horse that's quite literally an animal of prey, whose only defensive measure to danger is to run away, can stand here and fight through all of this, then fuck, maybe they can too. Despite being struck by shrapnel twice, Reckless Goosebumps. kept the Marines so well stocked with ammunition that they managed to melt one of the barrels of the 75 millimeter recoilless rifles. On the first day of battle alone, she made 51 round trips to the firing line, covering over 35 miles, delivering 386 rounds of ammunition, totaling over 9,000 pounds, and that's not including all the Marines that she carried back down the hill. At the end of the first day of battle, they took Reckless, gave her all the food and water that she would eat or drink, and then they laid her down to bed. She got to sleep for six hours before the first enemy artillery shell impacted and at that she was back up and ready to do it all over again and she repeated her performance from the day prior at the end of the second day nobody held outpost vegas at the top of the hill the chinese held one slope and the marines held the other and it is at this point that the marine corps leadership decided that if they can't hold the high ground there just isn't going to be a high ground anymore they called in the marine air wing and on the morning of the third day of battle the wait. marine corps dropped 28 tons of ordnance on top of the hill completely leveling every defensive structure and anything else that was up there. By the end of the third day, the Marines had taken the top of the hill where Outpost Vegas used to be, but then they saw that the Chinese were falling back into a ravine and they were going to go around the hill entirely. This is absolutely terrible because there aren't enough Marines on Outpost Vegas, Carson, and Reno combined to be able to go down there and stop the Chinese. If they're going to stand any chance in a fight, they have to have the high ground, so they absolutely cannot give it up. The problem is, on the back side of the hill that Outpost Vegas is on is where the ammunition depot is, as well as a mess tent that's been converted into an aid station. Oh. with over 200 wounded Marines and there's nothing that the Marines on top of the outpost can do to stop them. Then the Marines at Outpost Carson get an idea and they send a runner with a note to the aid station as fast as they can. He gives a note to the commander of the aid station who then tries to read the note to all 200 wounded Marines but the artillery fire is so loud that he can't be heard. So he resorts to just handing the note to one Marine who hands it to the next and the next and the next and after reading the note, every Marine hangs his head for a second and gets on his feet because the note reads... Chinese coming around the hill, dropping smoke, walk out into the smoke, throw grenades at smell of garlic. Apparently the Chinese military at this point smelled like garlic. I have no idea why, but it was a thing. And after all 200 Marines had read the note, they all stood up, grabbed every grenade that they could find and began walking 500 yards out to where the smoke screen was. It's 11 o'clock at night. It's dark. It's eerie. It's dead silent. The Marines aren't saying a word because they all know that this is probably going to be the end. They're calling for walking wounded to rejoin the fight. And that's never, ever a good thing. Yeah. And they're making their way to this smoke screen. They finally get there and they take a few steps into the smoke and they just stand there and they wait and they wait. And after 10 minutes, there's a faint smell of garlic and it keeps getting stronger really? and stronger and stronger. And the Marines know what's going to come next, but they just don't know when to start throwing these grenades. And then off in the distance in the smoke, they hear a single cough <laughs> and all the Marines just begin throwing these grenades into the smoke screen. Within a matter of seconds, they've completely exhausted their supply, throwing over 500 grenades into the smoke. And that was it. There was nothing left to do but stand there and wait for the enemy to come and get them. So that's what they did. They stood there and they waited and they waited and the smell of garlic got a little bit fainter and a little bit fainter. That and they, finally the Marines worked. are like, fuck it, I'm going to bed. So they walked back to the aid station, went to bed, woke up the next morning and holy shit, the enemy artillery had completely stopped and the battle was over. They would later find out that the Chinese suffered over 4,000 casualties trying to break through the Marine line. And after the incident at 11 o'clock at night with the smoke screen and the aid station, they simply could not afford to lose any more men and were forced to retreat. This might be the great, this might be one of the greatest stories I've ever heard. 500, first off, the garlic smell. I need, I need something. I need, I need an explanation. 500 grenades, 500. And it worked. Then that dude that cough is really regretting it now. But I guess that's the smoke, right? Okay, yeah. So that was it. The Marines did it. Against all odds, somehow the Marines managed to hold the line against a vastly superior force. 
Larger, larger force, not superior force. Very important detail. Preventing the enemy from retaking Seoul, giving NATO the Very political important. leverage they needed to negotiate peace talks and establishing and preserving the South Korea that we know today. And arguably it's all because of a single horse that absolutely refused to give up on her fellow Marines. And because of this, Reckless is declared the hero of Outpost Vegas and she is awarded the rank of Corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Shortly after the battle, the Marines get rotated out by a brigade from the Turkish military and the Marines finally get some much deserved R. After that, the war is really starting to wind down, so the Marines are going to pack up all their shit. They're going to board a Navy LST, which is basically an amphibious landing ship. That ship's going to take them all the way to Incheon, and then from there, they're just going to kind of hang out for a while and wait for the peace treaty to get signed. But since they're boarding a Navy vessel, they have to come up with a manifest of all the supplies, how many guys they got, all the equipment, how much everything weighs, yada, yada, yada. On the manifest, they write down one horse, reckless, Corporal type. The manifest makes its way to the captain of the LST. He's supposed to sign off on everything. He sees horse and he's like, what the fuck? The Marines are probably just messing with me. They're not actually bringing a horse on my ship. It's oh, probably wow. just like a pallet of beer and they wanted to let me know to account for the weight. It's fine. He signs off on the manifest, sends it back. It's all good. Fast forward a couple of weeks. The Marines start loading all their stuff up on the boat. Then they go to bring Corporal Reckless up onto the ship and the captain is like, whoa, whoa, whoa absolutely not you're not bringing a horse on my ship i've had the cleanest ship in the navy for two years running and this horse is going to ruin that to which the marines are like it's bro signed. you signed the manifest it's this is happening get over it <laughs> it's like it's like one of them tv shows where you're just kind of showing like like uh i can't remember i'm trying, I'm trying to think about one uh you ever seen that tv show the boondocks you probably have it and everything when huey no it was it was Riley. Yeah, he got the uh, permission to write the uh, Christmas story any way that he wanted. But when people started trying to contest him, since he had it in writing from one of his superiors, he just kept shoving it in his face. He was like, contract, contract, contract. That's basically what they were doing. They said, I am signed, signed, signed. Come on now. <laughs> One thing leads to another, Corporal Reckless gets on that ship. Once they get Reckless, all the equipment and all the Marines on board, the ship takes off and all the Navy members are kind of making fun of Reckless and the Marines because it's not normal for Marines to care this much about an animal and they're not treating Reckless with the respect that she deserves. They don't know. So when they demand that Reckless gets fed bacon, eggs, and beer, just like the Marines, the Navy absolutely refuses and they said they're only gonna give her cabbage and wheat. So that's what they do. This upsets Reckless's stomach and she proceeds to shit all over this body Boat for the next three days. A couple days later, Reckless starts feeling better. They're almost to Inchon. They're about to port, get off this boat. Everything's going to be great. At this point, the Marine Corps officers have a brilliant idea. They decide, hey, us and our men just went through one of the bloodiest battles in American military history. The horse has been sick this entire time. You know what would make everybody a lot happier? If instead of just parking the fucking boat and getting off like normal people, what if we did an amphibious landing, you know, for fun and training and stuff? Wouldn't that be great? To which all the enlisted men are like, fucking fine, whatever, let's just do it and get it over with. So they make an amphibious landing in Inchon for training, but guess what? Reckless doesn't understand that it's for training. She thinks this shit's for real. So Reckless becomes the only horse in Marine Corps history to successfully make an amphibious landing. So the Marines get settled down in Inchon and that's when they notice that there's a horse all over the news. It's in every newspaper, it's in every magazine, it's on every radio this broadcast. The entire world is talking about this horse, but it's not Corporal Reckless. It's some horse over in America called Native Dancer. It's the greatest horse in the world. It's gonna win the Kentucky Derby blah 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 and the marines are kind of getting pissed Get because they know for a fact that they have the best horse in the world and it's corporal reckless not native dancer and the marines are willing to put their money where their mouth is because they pull together over twenty five thousand dollars which is like over a quarter million dollars in today's money and they publicly offer it up as a wager to the owner wow. of native dancer wow. hey bring your horse over to south korea beat reckless in a race and you can have the money but this wasn't just going to be any that's right because reckless is a racehorse hmm Hmm. race this was going to be called the patty derby it was a mile and a half course uphill through rice patties and each horse wasn't going to have a rider and they were going to have to carry 192 pounds of ammunition unfortunately for everybody native dancers owner decided that they were not going to partake in this competition so now S the marines kind of just hung out until the end of the war Chicken. then the order comes down hey pack your shit it's time to go home the marines are like cool great grand wonderful how are we going to get reckless home at which point the leadership over at the marine corps is like well Here's the thing, we don't think that the 
taxpayers would appreciate spending their money to transport this horse all the way back to America. So uh, we're just gonna Maybe abandon there. her here. To which the entire Marine Corps is like, the fuck you are. They go into full Shamurai mode. They're gonna figure out how to get Corporal Reckless back to America through the back channels, whatever it takes. So they end up getting a hold of a public company called Pacific Transport, and they convince the owner to take Reckless all the way back to America. The only problem is Pacific Transport doesn't go to South Korea. The closest he can get is to Japan. Okay, cool. Now we just have to get Reckless to from Japan. South Korea to Japan. Reckless's platoon then gets a hold of the Marine Corps Air Wing, and they convince those Marines to let them smuggle Reckless onto a cargo plane going from South Korea to Japan. From there, they get Reckless onto the Pacific Transport ship. They take him all the way back to San Francisco, where the Marines are going to re-meet back up with Reckless. So this, this doesn't surprise me at all, right? The lens people are willing to get uh, go through to take care of their pets. I grew up with, uh, I grew up with a total of ten dogs, one parrot, a rabbit, three cats, and a tarantula, and a piranha, a whole lot of fish. So yes, I definitely understand the love that you can have of pets, but don't underestimate that people will do everything they possibly can for the care and safety of their pets. This is amazing. This is one of the greatest animal stories I've heard. Okay, fast forward, the Marines make it to San Francisco. The Pacific Transport ship makes it to San Francisco. The Marines go there to pick up Reckless, at which point they find out that Customs beat them there. And Customs called the Department of Agriculture. And the Department of Agriculture said, mm -mm, we're going to have this horse destroyed because she could have diseases. The Marines then explained to this destroyed. guy from the Department of Agriculture, look, this is a war hero. You're not killing this horse. She's coming with us. At which point the Department of Agriculture guy is like, oh no, she's staying here and we're going to have her destroyed. Now the Marines are kind of looking around at each other. They're looking at this pencil pusher from the Department of Agriculture and the Marines without saying a word have just communicated with their eyes. We're actually going to have to kill this guy and hide the body. <laughs> Department of Agriculture guy is finally starting to piece together how quickly and how far this might escalate. And he finally comes to his senses and he's like, okay, look, maybe, just maybe, I'll take a blood sample. I'll take it to the lab. And if she doesn't have any diseases, we'll release her. Hey, hey, I, you know, you know, the Marines, boy, they be, they Marines, you know what I'm saying? I, I don't doubt that one bit, man. A cold, dead stare from a Marine, especially one as a scene battle, the type of training they go through. They probably don't got to do much, man. It's kind of give you that. I can't even do it. You can't even do the stairs. You just look at them. That's all you got to do, man. Because they already know that you built different. You ain't like these other people right here. They don't just let, they don't, just, well, at least I assume, they don't just let anybody into the Marines, right? So we need some knuckle, knuckle busters, you know what I'm saying? I'll take a blood sample. I'll take it to the lab. And if she doesn't have any Better diseases, recognize. we'll release her. To which the Marines are like, that's a solid call. So the guy takes the blood sample, says it'll take me about a week to get the results. Go ahead and just leave the horse here. You guys can head out. At which the Marines said, nah, we're going to stay with the horse. And the agriculture guy is like, that's not necessary. And the Marines are like, oh, yeah, it is. Because at this point, the Marines have come to the conclusion that the communists were trying to kill Reckless for food and American bureaucracy is trying to kill Reckless just for fun and they cannot let her out of their sight ever again. So, agriculture guy gets a blood sample, he leaves, the Marines hang out with the horse for a little while and then they're like, oh hey, there was a Marine Corps ball tonight. Reckless is a Marine, let's go. Then they smuggled Reckless out of the ship. Then they smuggled her out of the port. Then somehow they got her all the way across San Francisco into the building, up the freight elevator, and they made it to the Marine Corps ball. Horse. Reckless walks in and she has just given every Marine in that room the excuse they were looking for to get absolutely hammered. Everybody's drinking beer, eating cake, including Corporal Reckless, and Reckless is also eating all the flower decorations. It's a great time. Everybody wakes up the next morning, super hungover. They all go out, they get breakfast, bacon, eggs, give some to Reckless. Now, here's the problem. They kind of have smuggled this horse out and they don't know what to do with it. They also can't let the government find out where the horse is because the government is actively trying to destroy her for no reason. Then once Reckless gets to Camp Pendleton, the American public finds out that Reckless made it home and everybody's super pumped. They want to know all about it. The news is getting involved. America's celebrating because fucking America's war horse made it home. This is America. awesome. Let's At which go. point the high ranking Marine officers that were going to abandon her are like, holy shit. Wow. What a great idea. You guys smuggled her all the way here and uh, we're just going to take credit for it because this is going really well for us. We had no idea that the American public would be okay with us doing the right thing and bringing a war hero home. We thought the American public wanted us spending millions and billions of dollars teaching 
fucking pigeons how to drive missiles and strap a napalm bombs onto bats and shit. We had no idea that doing the right thing would be so popular. So then they throw message. Throw a big parade, they have a big ceremony. Reckless gets promoted to E5, sergeant in the Marine Corps. They hook her up with this cool ass blanket. She gets awarded two purple hearts, one for each piece of shrapnel she took during the Battle of Outpost Vegas. Oh. It's a huge deal. She starts doing commercials, endorsements. The rule with that was she doesn't work for free. She's willing to do charity events for free. Anything else, if somebody wanted her to endorse a product, it had to be a product she actually liked. If it was food, it better be food she liked. If it was a drink, it nice. better be a drink that she liked drinking. Otherwise, she wasn't going to do it. And those companies had to pay $1,000 for the privilege of working with someone. Sergeant Reckless and that money went to a charity for the Marine Corps. And here's the thing with Reckless being a sergeant, most animals are like, oh, they're such and such rank, they're this rank, but they're not actually that rank. It's just like a symbolic thing. With Reckless, it was not a symbolic thing. That's the real, Marines treated her like rank. she was truly and legitimately a sergeant in the Marine Corps. Nobody that was a lower rank than her was allowed to give her orders or tell her what to do, okay? If the privates Respect. were standing around eating food and stuff and Reckless wandered up and nudged one, that was an order to share some food and that private needed to obey it. She was given her own private stable right outside the post commander's house and there was a standing order that she was never to carry anything heavier than her blanket ever again again. Sergeant Reckless even had an assistant. Every time they got a batch of new recruits, they would find out who the farm kid was, and he would be tasked with taking care of Sergeant Reckless. Now, part of taking care of Sergeant Reckless was taking her out for her daily exercise. Now, how do you exercise a horse if you can't ride a horse because there's a standing order that she can't carry anything heavier than her blanket, and even if she could, you wouldn't be allowed to ride her because she's a higher rank than you? I have no idea. Neither did the Marine Corps, so they told this private, Fucking figure it out. So this kid just had to start running next to Reckless five miles a day, every day. And this wow. pattern carried wow. on. Every time a new kid came, he just started running five miles a day with Reckless. And it became a running joke. Jesus Christ, literally a running joke that whoever was taking care of Reckless was the most in shape Marine in the Marine Corps. After a little while, the PR started to die down, but the high ranking officers in the Marine Corps didn't want that to happen because having the Marine Corps in the headlines all the time was really good. So they concocted a plan to stay in the headlines even longer. They were going to get some badass thoroughbred Kentucky Derby winning racehorse in here to have a kid with Sergeant Reckless. So that's exactly what they do. They find breed. the thoroughbred horse they're gonna breed her with. They hire this PR firm, getting ready for all the news and publicity and blah, blah, blah. And then in true military fashion, the officers then proceed to not tell anybody that they fucking should. You know, like the private that's in charge of taking care of Sergeant Reckless. So from his perspective, one day he gets an order seemingly for no fucking reason to take Sergeant Reckless over to the normal horse stables, which never ever happens and stick her into an empty pen. So that's what he does. And he's like, okay, cool. I'm gonna like go get lunch now or take a shit or whatever. So he leaves for a minute and one of the other Marines comes by and then sticks just your normal garden variety Marine bucking horse in the same pen oh, as Reckless, not man. knowing it was Reckless because Reckless is never in those pens anyways. So fast forward a little bit, Sergeant Reckless's assistant comes back and Reckless and this bucking horse are midway through a horizontal jogging session and he's not about to get in there and stop it. Okay, now Sergeant Reckless's assistant is having a full on panic attack attack because sergeant reckless the i guess you could say they were horsing around getting their gallop in never changing their gait demonstrating a whole lot of horsepower sorry i had to get those puns in before this video ended <laughs> and now sergeant reckless's assistant is having a full-on panic attack because sergeant reckless the pride of the marine corps is currently getting taken to pound town on his watch and he is definitely gonna be in trouble for it. So as soon as they finish, he runs in, Sound gets effects. reckless, takes her in the barn. He's brushing out her mane. He's getting the scratches off of her sides. He's trying to hide all the evidence. And then while they're in the barn taking care of that, that no, other- that, that garden variety, uh, that garden, oh man, oh no, see, see that guy. Yeah, he knew what he was doing. He said, this is my lucky day. Y'all done messed up. Yep, mm -hmm. scratches. I don't know how common that is when it comes to horse and intercourse. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I'm gonna stop thinking about it now. Another bucking horse gets taken out of the pen and this big old fancy truck pulls up with this big old fancy trailer and this big ass Kentucky Derby winning thoroughbred race horse gets unloaded and put in the pen that Reckless was just in. He gets done cleaning Reckless up in the barn, takes her out and everybody's like, bro, what are you doing? Reckless is supposed to be in there with this other horse. 
get him in there. So then all those guys leave to get lunch or do whatever. And Sergeant Reckless's assistant is like, okay, there's no way I'm leaving. I'm not going to have this happen again. I'm going to stay here the entire time and make sure there's no hanky panky. There'll be no riding the baloney pony around here ever again. I got to make sure this does not happen. So he sits there and cock blocks his thoroughbred the entire time. So as far as he's concerned, mission accomplished. Nobody ever needs to know that Reckless got deflowered on his watch. Pregnant. It's going to be fine. Then fast forward 28 days later, he shows up at Reckless's stable first thing in the morning to take care of her. And there's a bunch of high ranking military officers and a bunch of news crews right outside the stable. He rolls up like, what's uh, what's going on? Shit. And the general is like, Reckless is pregnant. And he's like, oh, OK, is that that's a good thing. And they're like, yeah, no, that's great. That's a terrific thing. At this point, the news crews have kind of put together that this is a kid in charge of taking care of Sergeant Reckless. So one of them yells out, hey, what's the name of that thoroughbred racehorse that she's having the baby with again? At which point he just responds like, what are you talking about? I don't know its name. It was just one of the random marine bucking horses we had in the pen. Record scratch, dead silence, pure confusion. The general grabs this private yanks him around the corner of the stable. It's like, what the fuck did you just say? So he explains to the general everything that happened. And the general is like, you idiot. Reckless was supposed to sleep with that big ass thoroughbred racehorse to which he's like, he's following well, orders. Somebody should have told me nope. that. I don't know what to tell you. So now the, hey, hey. nah, hundred percent, bro. Ain't his fault. He was just following orders. Hey, stuff runs downhill, right? Take that up there, bro. Mm hmm plan is officially ruined, the news crews leave, and the PR firm has to figure out how to piece this thing back together. And the plan they come up with is to get a big ass sign and put it up on the hill by Camp Pendleton, and the sign simply says, it's a dot dot dot. Yeah, if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, in the plot twists that absolutely nobody saw coming, the United States Marine Corps is actually responsible for inventing gender reveals. And that's how they still managed to generate a bunch of hype for Sergeant Reckless's kid, getting the entire world to speculate as to whether or not it was going to be a boy or a girl. The pregnancy goes great. She goes on to give birth to a cult, AKA a boy. They go out, oh, write boy in big cult. blue letters on their sign. And then the Marines throw a big ass party because they're amped, unwittingly throwing the world's first ever gender reveal party, which I'm going to hold against really? the Marine Corps forever. But now everybody wants to know, what are we going to name this young Colt? So the high ranking. I, I refuse to believe that. I think knowingly, right? Because there's a lot of cultures out there. 100% can't gender reveal bars can't be yet knowingly to our knowledge anyways. Marine officers step in again and they're like, I have another great PR idea. Let's have a competition where all the Marines can submit their ideas for names. We'll pick the best one and that guy can win a week of leave. Brilliant idea. So that's exactly what they do. Hundreds of Marines send in their ideas for names. The front runners were like Semper Fi, Freedom, Liberty, pretty generic stuff, but that's yeah. what you have to do when you have a big public figure like Sergeant Reckless and her new baby. But the commanding officer in charge is just like, I don't like any of these names. I'm going to name it myself. So he just decides that he's going to pick a random private and be like, hey, you're you're the winner, even though you didn't pick the name, but I'm just going to say you're the winner so I don't look like an asshole. And then he named the cult Fearless, which that's a great name. I'm just getting really, really jaded with bureaucrats and high ranking officers fearless. in this video for some reason. Sorry about that. Anyways, fast forward a couple years, 1959, for Sergeant Reckless is now getting promoted to Staff Sergeant Reckless E6. There's a 1700 man parade, a 19 gun salute. The Marines make a huge deal out of it because well, Reckless deserves it. So that's what they do. And in the crowd that day was none other than the new private fearless of the United States Marine Corps, which I thought was pretty cool. That's Later that cool, year, private. she would give birth to another boy named Dauntless. And then a couple years after that, she would give birth to yet another boy Name. named Chesty, named after Chesty Puller, the most decorated Marine of all time. Okay. And as rumor has it, the last Marine to ever ride Reckless. From there, Sergeant Reckless would retire oh. and spend the rest of her life living on Camp Pendleton as the highly regarded, highly respected war hero that she was before passing away in 1968. I need to know did she ever get laid or bred with a thoroughbred like they intended with those other two kids? Don't listen, Ch Chastity. 
So in conclusion, this has been the story of Sergeant Reckless, the hero of Outpost Vegas, America's greatest war horse, the four-legged Marine that fought during the Korean War, which is commonly referred to as the Forgotten War. But as is the case with most of us, it's not that we forgot it, it's that we were never taught about it in the first place. Facts. So if you made it this far in the video, Facts. I really hope that you learned something. If you oh, want to support the channel, best way to do that is go check out thefatelectrician.com. We got merch, I got a Patreon with deleted scenes. Otherwise, until next time, quack bang, out. Got it, got it. Outro. What are you still doing here? Leave. I have to go enjoy my not single ply toilet paper that I got at the store just for me. Sounds like my wife. <laughs> no, I actually am so glad I did a reaction to this because that might have been one of the greatest war stories I've heard, let alone animal horse stories. So anyways, that's the end of this video. Dave's out.